Come closer. Let me tell you a story. A story of a kingdom and its people that is long forgotten by many. But details of their distinct and unique ways are unmatched. We've heard tales of kings and historical legends since time immemorial, but the narratives have mostly been centered around men. This is not surprising, as even in the meaning of the word history, we can see that it is a story of him and not her. However, in African history, we have many tales of women who have grabbed history by the horns and surpassed our expectations. There have been mentions of a handful of strong, powerful women, women kingmakers, warrior queens who didn't just sit on their levels when there was a need to rise for the sake of their land, children and kingsmen. These women cut across different ethnic groups and cultures, yet they have one thing in common, bravery. In this series, our focus will be on the Amazons of the Dahomey Kingdom. These warrior women who fought alongside men on the battlefields were unfazed by battle terrors because they were born and baptized with the spirit of war. They fought with the skills that only the gods could have bestowed upon mortal beings, and nothing could break their spirits. These fearless women were prominent from the 1700s until 1904, and an entire military unit was made from them. The Daomi Amazons went out conquering lands and territories and even fearlessly stood against the invasion of the European forces. This all-female military originated from the Fon people, who are the largest ethnic group in the southern region of present-day Benin. The Amazons came about because the Fon people fully empowered their women to serve in the military. However, before we dive into the world of the Daomi Amazons, let's get to know more about the Kingdom of Daomi. The West African Kingdom, known as Daomi, prospered in the 18th and 19th century in what is now Southern Benin. As with most ancient cities, there have been several myths surrounding the foundational history of Dahomey. One of the stories that gained popularity was that of the royal lineage of Alada. But how did the people of Alada came about? The ancestors of the Fon people emerged from a village cluster called Tado in what is now present-day Togo. There was a popular prince in Tado called Agasu and he was an ambitious man who wanted to become king. The prince declared his intention to reign supreme and caused internal struggles in the states, which led to the killing of the crown prince Ajahuto. Seeing his plans fail and not wanting to die in the battle for the throne, Agasu and his supporters went to seek fortunes elsewhere. After several years, they settled at Alada. Alada became a kingdom that was founded by Agasu, and it was known to the Europeans as the Great Ardra. Based on the European records, Alada was already in existence in 1610, and it was called Petit Ada, a coastal community in which the capital was an inland town 23 miles away from the sea. Most kingdoms in this era operated under a political system of absolute monarchy, and soon the struggle for the kingship of Alada began. This happened within the first two decades of the 17th century. History claims that three princes were entangled in a political dispute to rule Alada. There was more internal strife as factions warred against factions until ultimately one of the brothers emerged the winner. It was required of the other two to leave the monarchy of Alada with their followers after losing the struggle. One ventured southeast and established Port Novo on the shore east of Weida. The other, though Aklin, headed north to discover the kingdom of Abomi, which would become the center of future Dahomey. Unfortunately, it is a tale of never-ending disputes because around 1620 to 1625, the children of Doaklin also had another succession dispute, which led to the victory of Dakon Donu, who is considered the founder of the Dahomey dynasty. Dako practiced state policy that involved conquering the neighboring communities. 
he was known to have made the Aja clan predominant during this rule. Dako also founded a new form of succession, which became an important principle of unbroken successions. Dako constructed different projects such as the royal palaces of Abomi, and he also built an underground town called Agongonto Sungodo. Dako's reign came to an end, and Egbeja, also known as Huegbeja, succeeded him as king. His reign, which lasted from 1640 to 1680, was marked by numerous military attempts to extend Dahomey. He created a state that was centralized and had an autocratic form of rule. Just like the blood flows in the vein, so does the spirit of war flows in the bloodline of Daoklin's descendants. They seem to always be filled with the desire to go to war and expand their territory. Dohaklin's great-grandson, Agaja, was instrumental in this aspect. He can be likened to a war general because he so carefully planned out his war strategies. He was also quick to realize that something was missing to give him the conquest he sought. He needed weapons similar to those used by Europeans. He obtained these weapons primarily from vendors in the Gulf of Guinea. With the guns at his disposal, Agaja was prepared for combat and invaded the previous sister nations that had been established and were ruled by his kin, who were Doraklin's brother's descendants. Both Alada and Weda, which already had European forts, were successfully taken by Agaja. This provided him access to vast arsenals of more advanced firearms. This effort and the war strategies of Agada were victorious and it gave birth to the Kingdom of Dahomey, which began as an extended state from the original Dahomey and included the provinces of Alada, Weda and Abomi. At first, Dahomey's main economic power was derived from soy farming. It was the most commonly practiced profession in Dahomey. At the end of each dry season, the fields were prepared and the amount of work required to till the ground depended on whether the soil had previously been farmed. It was difficult and challenging labor, but it was their way of life. However, we will later see that the Dahomey truly become wealthy as a result of the slave trade. Slaves were either retained on the royal plantations that produced foodstuffs for the army and the courts, or auctioned to the Europeans in return for weapons. Hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans were transported from its shores for more than 250 years. Before the 20th century, the storytellers of the kingdoms of Dahomey were all outsiders. Slave traders, anti-slavery programs, envoys and representatives of European governments. Many people were terrified by the stories of Dahomey, and those who heard about them disliked the monarchy. A visitor asserted that the ruler would sail a boat on a sea of blood formed by the sacrificed victim's severed necks. Others described men who were half nude and hungry to eat the body of a corpse. North America regarded these ceremonies as sinister beliefs and tagged the practice as part of voodoo, including the worship of reptiles and vegetation. It was also reported that the powerful ruler who oversaw this atrocity resided in a palace enclosed by 12 foot high mud walls layered with stacks of skulls and bones in the nation's capital of Abomey. Other claims mentioned the king would lie on silk cushion seats whilst being served by hundreds of ladies or he would sit on a throne covered by the heads of noble adversaries whilst the eunuchs who engaged in scheming with the king's wife guarded the royal harem. Basically, these stories claimed that the state and the rest of the population were all the king's slaves. These tales of terror were not particularly pleasing and created negative stereotypes for the kingdom. It led to people ignoring what made up the kingdom in the first place, such as the occupations, the values, culture, morals, religion, and the mode of rulership. The reality was that Dahomey, just like many ancient kingdoms, was heavily involved in fighting, raiding, and enslaving other territories to mark their strength and dominance. In the process of doing this, they would take spoils of war, which aside from the properties of the defeated, also included captured prisoners of war, earning them a spot as a central player in the transatlantic slave trade from West Africa. Some of these 
prisoners of war or POW were sold abroad whilst others were maintained as household slaves inside this realm. And yet, some were slain during rituals honoring the royal family's ancestors. Despite all this, the kingdom's leadership ironically demonstrated great respect for human life as a fundamental right and strictly regulated the taking of life. Furthermore, there were no pools of blood and cannibalism seemed to be no more than a rumor. In summary, Dahomey was neither a nation that terrorizes people nor a paradise where everyone lived happily ever after. The dynasty of Dahomey was set up in such a way as to include a modest and transferable economic and political elite. The king in whose name the kingdom was controlled was the principal ruler. The monarchy was primarily made up of men and women from various Dahomean social classes and lineages, each of whom held a different set of power according to their rank. These included the ministers of the king, the chiefs at the province and village levels, heads of military, and the high priest of the kingdom. As each member of the monarchy was particularly reliant upon the king for their prolonged access to power, they were all devoted to him. However, as a group, they could take action despite the king's objections. The choosing of monarchs was also heavily dependent on the ongoing developments both inside and outside the realm. The king was neither a captive nor a figurehead of his monarchy. Nobody through a pure chance of birth became the ruler of Dahomey. The king was selected from the sons of the previous king, but only from those that had been born after their father had already been acknowledged as the heir or installed as the king. The heir to the throne was usually the most ambitious son who established himself as a worthy ruler by forging connections with his brothers, notable commoners and strong women in the royal court. The history of this vast kingdom cannot be better clarified without the contribution of the women who lived there. Women were properly recognized and never subjugated to the shadows, unlike in other European communities at the time. However, the majority of the women who participated in the monarchy came from the palace, meaning they were the people who lived in the royal buildings. By the end of the 19th century, the palace as an institution housed roughly 8,000 people who resided in several royal houses spread across the country. Though this number includes some eunuchs, women made up the vast majority of the 8,000. All the women connected to the palace were referred to as Ahosi, where Aho means dependent, follower, or subordinate, and Si signifies spouses of the king. In a polygamous family that served as the government of the state, everyone was active in running the country and advancing the interest of the monarchy. The women of the palace represented all strata of Daomi society. They were made up of free-born commoners, slaves, war captives, as well as women from affluent homes. The palace of the kingdom was designed to function as a political, economic, and social institution. Its center was in the Abomi capital city, which also served as the official residence of the king and his court. As a result, a sizable portion of Haosi population lived there. The central Abomi Palace was a collection of royal homes, with each new addition being built next to the one before by consecutive kings. By the end of the 19th century, it had nearly 100 acres of land under it. So now that we are updated about the history of Dahomey, the next episode will discuss the origin of the Dahomey Amazons. Stay tuned and I hope to see you there. Dr. Cartel out.